Good afternoon. Authors at Google and Y are pleased to welcome back Paul Ingrassi to share with us his recent book, Engines of Change, A History of the American Dream in 15 Cars. Paul Ingrassi is the former Detroit bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 1993 with Joseph B. White for reporting on management crisis at General Motors. Ingrassi has chronicled the auto industry for more than 25 years. His prior book, Crash Course, the American automobile industry's road from glory to disaster was his, was the first book published about the 2009 bailouts and bankruptcies of General Motors and Chrysler. He's a frequent op-ed contributor to many publications and is currently with Reuters, and I'd like you to welcome my dad to talk. <laughs> Very nice, Adam. Thank you. Whoops. Well, thanks, Adam. That was a very generous introduction. Um, Adam was kind enough to mention the, um, uh, the Pulitzer Prize that came my way back in 1993 when I was based in Detroit, and Adam was growing up there. And my best memory of that story actually is um, uh, the next day, one of his younger brothers went to school and told his teacher his dad had just won the Pulitzer Surprise, okay? <laughs> I think he had it about right. Um, I, I just want to talk to you about my book a little bit, Engines of Change, which is really uh, a look at the last hundred years of American cultural evolution through, um, uh, through 15 cars, and the cars are listed here. I don't have time to go through all the 15 during this presentation, but I'm going to go through a bunch of them and then just sort of scroll through the rest of these in, in a quick order. Um, and this was really kind of a fun book to do, uh, basically. I mean, writing books is a lot of work, but I'm sort of sorry this one is dumb because it really gave me a chance to really dig in, uh, you know, to a, a lot of things in automobiles and the history of automobiles and the cultural impact of automobiles that has fascinated me uh, for a long time and I think has a lot of fascination for uh, you know, a lot of people. Um, I imagine it's a little bit weird, to be honest with you, talking to a Google audience about the cultural impact of cars, because, or certain cars, because at some point someone's going to do a great book about the cultural impact of key developments in technology, you know, whether it was the first Mac computer, um, you know, or, or, or whatever it was, the invention of the browser, uh, you know, all that, all that sort of thing. And uh, I think that the, um, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, these things have a tremendous impact on how we think and live in a lot of ways, and certain automobiles really uniquely captured or shaped uh, the spirit of their day, either reflected it or, or, or captured it. Um, you know, and um, at, at some point, like I say, someone will do the, you know, the history of technology and using this sort of approach to looking, uh, looking at technological innovation, you know, back in the days um, uh, before laptop was a high-tech term, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, but my, my really expertise is in automobiles. As Adam can tell you, I have zero uh, expertise in technology. In fact, I might even ask one of you to come up and forward my slides during the middle of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, I started out with the premise of this book that American culture, let's, let's forget about cars for a minute. American culture is like this big tug of war, okay, uh, between the practical and the pretentious, uh, between the ordinary and the ostentatious, you know, up down versus uptown versus downtown, Saturday night, Sunday morning, um, that sort of thing, and that is really reflected in the all the automobiles in this book, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, show you that as I go along here, and especially in the first two automobiles, which are the Ford Model T and the uh, the LaSalle, which is a dead brand now, but was the first yuppie car of its day. Uh, the Model T was introduced in the fall of 1908. It was literally the car that put Americans on wheels. Other cars of the day were, you know, sold for well over $1,000 at the time, and the introductory price of the Model T was only $850. It was the first car with interchangeable parts. Uh, it was Henry Ford's vision of how to put people make America a mobile automotive society. And it had interchangeable parts and a very flexible chassis that could sort of go anywhere. I mean, the, the roads of that day were even worse than the roads of today, I might add. Um, uh, there was a, uh, one of the uh, Henry Ford's favorite jokes was about the farmer 
who asked to be buried in his Model T Ford because the Model T had gotten him out of every hole he'd ever been in, okay? Um, and, um, you know, another, another sort of apocryphal, perhaps, story of the day was about a university researcher who went out to, a, to an isolated rural homestead and talked to the housewife there and said, look, I don't understand this. You have a Ford Model T sitting in front of, in front of your log cabin here, but you don't even have, you know, indoor plumbing. What, tell me about your priorities. And she said, well, well look, it's pretty simple. You can't go to town in a bathtub. And that sort of explains the, the, the value of the Model T. It really made uh, automotive transportation going anywhere you wanted, when you wanted, available to the common man. And it really ended rural peasantry in America in a way that, the, um, uh, uh, that Europe never had that happen, to be honest with you. Uh, so the Ford Model T is introduced in 1908. Uh, five years later, in 1913, Henry Ford comes up with this amazing innovation called the moving assembly line. He actually got his inspiration of this from the disassembly lines of the stockyards of Chicago, you know, where, where animals were being slaughtered and cut into steaks. He sort of reversed the process, right? And, and that's how they assembled cars. Um, and a few months after that, in January of 1914, he started with, the, he followed that with a $5 day. The average factory wage at the time was about two and a quarter a day. He more than doubled that. Uh, and he incurred the wrath of the Wall Street Journal and a lot of other uh, industrialists, basically, but he paid people a $5 day. Um, and it really, all that really made mass manufacturing come into play, and it created the, the foundations for the American middle class. So this one development of his, the Model T Ford, had um, incredible, incredible legs, if you will, incredible impact. By the early 1920s, Henry Ford applied all those manufacturing efficiencies, and he lowered the price, the, the basic price of the Model T from $850 to $260. Cheaper than ever, right? But by that time, models, Model T sales were falling dramatically. And why was that? It was really pretty simple, basically. The, the, they didn't call the Roaring Twenties roaring for nothing. America was becoming an urban society, and people wanted automobiles not only for physical transportation, but they wanted them for social mobility, if you will, to show off their status in life and that sort of thing. So along comes General Motors with a different idea about cars. It'll, it'll, it'll sell them for more money, but make them snazzier, sexier, a little more appeal, a little more stylish. Um, and this is what you get. You get the LaSalle. It's the first yuppie car. It's a beautiful automobile, even today, looking at its design proportions. It was the... Um, uh, it was the first automobile uh, designed by Ar Harley Earl, who was the father of American automobile design. And it was launched in 1927, which incidentally was the same year that the Model T died. Um, and this, you know, by driving a Model T, um, you, you know, you could get anywhere, but you wouldn't be able to show off. By driving this car, you could really show you had arrived. So the, the, sort of the bookends, if you will, of... Uh, uh, of practicality and pretension were really uniquely captured in these two cars. And ironically, you know, the, the Model T's demise came in the same year that the LaSalle was launched. Um, so after, after the, uh, the LaSalle is alive from, you know, from the 1927 to 1940 when GM discontinued the brand, uh, but uh, the 30s and the 40s don't really have much of a place in my book, to be honest with you, because uh, Cultural evolution sort of ran into two big hiccups uh, in America in the 30s and the 40s. One was called the Depression, right? And the next was called the War. In World War II, all civilian automobile production was, was, was discontinued. It was curtailed. So, you know, those factories in Detroit were building planes and tanks and military transports and all that sort of thing. So the whole car thing sort of discontinued for a while. But then comes 1953. 1953 is a seminal year in America. Um, the, um, what, what happened in 53 was the Korean War ended. Hugh Hefner started this magazine called Playboy. Um, a young singer named Elvis Presley began his recording career. So you get this picture, right, of a whole generation of Americans that had grown up, that had come of age knowing first depression and then war, so real privation when they were coming of age. And all of a sudden, we had peace. Um, 
And this was the year that Jack Kennedy went to the Senate. It was the year that Eisenhower went to the White House. We had peace, we had prosperity, and you get this picture of a whole generation of Americans who had grown up in tough times kind of wanting to let loose a little bit. And here comes the Corvette. The first Corvette is pictured on the upper right there. And it was a disaster. The Corvette was a disaster at first. It was a, had an anemic six-cylinder engine. I mean, it looked kind of cool. But the six-cylinder engine was slow. It had a two-speed automatic transmission. Uh, the roof leaked. I mean, it had a pullover roof. They were all convertibles. But the roof leaked. In fact, a couple of owners who bought their Corvettes during that day actually drilled holes in the floor to make sure the rainwater could drain out properly, you know, during storms. Um, so about a year, uh, you know, about a year after the uh, GM introduced the Corvette, the company was ready to kill the car. It was, was going to discontinue it. And this came to the attention of a young engineer named Zora Arcus Duntoff. He's a mid-level engineer at Chevy. Um, and so it'd be like, for example, if one of you guys, sort of a, any of you who might be a mid-level engineer at, at Google, got word that the company was about to um, discontinue Chrome entirely. And he, he just wasn't going to take this line down. He skipped up through several layers of management and wrote a letter to the top guy at Chevrolet and said, look, you know, we cannot let this happen. Ford's about to introduce the Thunderbird. If we retreat where Ford introduces the Thunderbird, we're going to you know, take a black eye, in the, and not only just in the face of the auto industry, but really in the face of uh, all America, in the eyes of every, everyone in America. So uh, the irony about Zora Arcus Duntoff was he was raised as a Bolshevik. He was born in, uh, he was born in 1910 in St. Petersburg. His parents were Bolshevik functionaries, basically. Uh, so he grew up during the revolution. After the revolution, um, his parents were posted to Berlin, of all places, in the 30s as Russian diplomats. And then when the, the war broke out between Russia and Germany, he had to flee um, and got up, managed to get out of Europe, came to America, finds himself in Detroit, and you had the irony of the all-American sports car, the Chevrolet Corvette, being saved by a Bolshevik boy. Uh, but Zora Ar this car would not be alive today, um, frankly, uh, without this guy's vision and determination to, to save the car. It, literally, management was ready to kill it, and he pleaded, let me improve it, so he went back and did a lot of work on it, and over the years, it just got to be a really, uh, a really iconic automobile. Um, the other signature car of America in the 1950s, remember, this is the post-war Pax Americana, right? It's peace, prosperity, the economy's doing well, was tail fins. Uh, they were actually introduced by Harley Earl in 1948, uh, and they were sort of small at first, little like finlets on the back of fenders, if you know what I mean. But in the mid-1950s, mid Chrysler, which was really hurting, its market share was sagging, brought in a new top designer, and he started putting bigger and bigger fins on the back of Chrysler's cars. And as a matter of fact, um, what Chrysler did was not, not only market these fins as um, styling, styling cues, right? Chrysler actually sold them, uh, billed them as safety devices. I know it's hard to believe, but the, the exact terms of the old sales brochures were these were called graceful directional stabilizers, okay? A little dodgy, I'll admit it. But so what happened was that the, the, this is the 1959 C Cadillac Eldorado Biritz, the biggest tail fins of all time. This is like, you know, remember the Jetsons, anyone? Okay, this is like George Jetson's car, sort of. But what, what happened was a, a young General Motors designer named Chuck Jordan, he just passed away um, uh, a couple years ago. I was fortunate enough to, inter to interview him before he died. Uh, but he was a young, he later became vice president of styling at GM, but he was a young Cadillac designer. He heard rumors about Chrysler's 1957 models. He took a drive over his lunch hour one day, snuck around in the back of a Chrysler storage facility, and saw the 57s with their big fins, hopped in his car, drove back to his office in a panic, ran in to talk to his boss and said, we're about to get out finned, okay? So GM put its designers back to the drawing board, and a couple years later, you know, it takes a couple years to really bring a car to market. Um, they came out with the, the biggest tail fins ever. And my favorite quote about the tail fins came from uh, Bill Mitchell, who was uh, Harley Earl's successor. He said, you know, I say if you take the tail fins off a Cadillac, it's like taking the antlers off a deer. You got a big rabbit, okay? Um, so anyway, 
nothing quite symbolized the sky's the limit ethos of America in the 1950s as, as these tail fins. But remember what I said about you know, the ostentatious and the practical, right? We are about to swing back to the practical in a really big way. This is the anti-Cadillac, OK? Um, it came out in, um, in the really 1930s. Ironically, the, the Beetle and later the Microbus, which was developed right after World War II, but it really had the same, has the same underlying uh, ve vehicular architecture, the same chassis as the Beetle. Uh, the Beetle was Hitler's car. I mean, the irony of the Volkswagen Beetle is it went from Hitler's car to hippie icon. I mean, you could not make this up, right? This is like the epic automotive journey of all time. Um, it was actually developed at Hitler's behest to put, uh, put Germans on wheels the way Henry Ford's Model T had put Americans on wheels. Um, and the, uh, it was very practical, not at all pretentious, as you see. Um, and it, was, um, it came out just before the war, but right, right after the first few Beetles were built, World War II broke out, and therefore Beetle production was curtailed till after the war. Um, and what happened was really then a, some American GIs who were stationed in Germany after the war started driving these things. It was the only car they could get. They liked it. They brought it back to America. And it sort of took off, surprisingly, in the, in the 50s. More and more people started buying them. Back then, two-car families were a rarity, maybe 10, 20 percent of Americans had second cars. This was sort of the ideal second car, if you will, cheap, easy. Uh, you didn't need to carry the whole family in it. Um, so, the, um, so the Beetle sort of gradually grew uh, in, in sales. It wasn't even named the Beetle, by the way. The original name was the Croft Dirk Freude Wagen, which meant the strength through joy car. It was chosen by Hitler, sort of a dumb name, but uh, after the war, the Germans called it the Volkswagen sedan. They thought the word Beetle was um, derogatory. Uh, so they wouldn't even allow the word Beetle to be used in the sales literature until the early 19, 1970s. But Detroit was sort of shocked by this, right? Um, they, they see the Beetle and they think, you know, to, to, to buy a Beetle, you've got to be like either a Pinko or a Weirdo or a Cheapo, uh, maybe all three. So it was sort of mystifying that basically in Detroit's views, uh, that, that the Beetle took off. And then the microbus came along as well. Um, the, um, uh, so what really made the Beetle take off in the 60s and made it sort of the hippie icon was not only its simplicity, but the great funny advertising. They had, a, they had a great advertising agency here in New York called Doyle Dame Birnbach. And they had marvelous ads. Um, this is, these, these are two of my favorites. Um, uh, they found out, uh, the, the people at DDB found out that uh, literally a hillbilly couple who lived in the Ozarks in a camp cabin without running water had their mule pass away and went out and bought a beetle to replace the mule. So a guy fly, one of the guys in the agency, Bob Cooperman, who later became the chairman of the agency, flies out to the Ozarks, knocks on the door of the log cabin. Mr. Redmond Hensley, the guy pictured here, answers the door. Mr. Cooperman explains, I'm from New York, I'm from an ad agency, we want to take your picture and put you in an ad. Mr. Hensley thinks it's a city slicker scheme to get his, to steal his land. He runs and grabs a shotgun, okay. They sort of calm things down and smooth things over after that. And they do this wonderful ad in American Gothic style, right? I mean, there's Mr. and Mrs. Hensley with the pitchfork. There's the beetle and there's the, cab the cabin they lived in. And the headline is great. It was the only thing to do after the mule died. And this is the kind of the, the, the hip, irreverent kind of stuff they did. Um, the actual, the real hippie favorite, of course, was the, the microbus. And as a matter of fact, it was such a hippie favorite that in 1995, this um, musician you probably heard of named Jerry Garcia uh, passed away. Uh, he was young, but he had, you know, sort of lived a hard life in a lot of ways, let's put it that way. Um, Volkswagen took out this ad in Rolling Stone and other magazines, which shows that it's a sparse pencil sketch of a, of a microbus with a teardrop coming out of one of the headlights. I mean, it's advertising, but it's like really art, frankly. It's just a beautiful ad. Uh, the word Volkswagen doesn't even appear. It doesn't need to. The only text is Jerry Garcia uh, and the, the year he was born and the year he passed away. So again, you have the sort of the practical and the, and the, and the pretentious. Now, 
This actually is one of my favorite cars in the book, even though it's a tragic car and it was a literally a fatally flawed car. Um, and remember, this book is not the 15 best cars of all time or worst cars. It's really cars that had a defining influence on how we think and how we live as a people. And the Chevy Corvair surely was one of those. It, it was really GM's answer to the, the Beetle. Uh, the Beetle did not have its engine in the front. It was a rear engine car with an air-cooled engine, so there was no radiator. Made it very lightweight. Put the wind engine right on top of the drive wheel, so there was great traction uh, in the snow. This genius, Ed Cole, who was running Chevrolet at the time, the guy who really uh, helped develop the Corvette, uh, Cole had a vision of a bigger rear-engine air-cooled car called the Corvair. And by the way, when it came out in 1960, he made the cover of Time. Um, it's, so the, the car got 29 miles to the gallon. That's amazing for that day. It's not even bad for today, is it, really? Uh, but in that day, most cars got 11 or 12 miles to the gallon. So it was, it was really incredible because it didn't have the, the weight of a radiator and didn't have the drive shaft to connect the you know, the engine in front to the drive wheels and back. The engine was right in back. The problem was the Corvair, unlike the Beetle, was a longer car. And all that weight in the back made it susceptible to spinning out around corners. So the Corvair, Corvair does pretty well for a few years. And then in 1965, this young lawyer, he's unknown, he's out of work, but he's fascinated with automobile safety. And he writes this book called Unsafe at Any Speed. And his name, of course, is Ralph Nader. At first, the book went nowhere. I mean, no one even noticed this book was published. But then the New York Times revealed that General Motors had hired private detectives to spy on Nader's private life because they wanted to know who is this guy sort of bad-mouthing our car. Uh, when word of this broke in the New York Times, there were hearings in front of Congress. Uh, a fellow named Jim Roach, who was then the president of, uh, of General Motors, went down from Detroit to Washington and apologized publicly to Nader um, in front of Congress with all the network TV cameras going. One of the ironies is, by the way, that Nader missed the apology. He missed the apology because he did not own a car and couldn't get a taxi that morning, okay? And you couldn't make it up. Um, but after that, you know, basically the book became a bestseller. Corvair sales uh, nosedived. And the ramifications of this car on our life and our society were just remarkable. For one thing, um, the government changed its whole attitude toward regulating industry. So before the Corvair, regulation of industry, whether it be you know, coal mining, meat packing, car building, uh, computer making, anything, was really very light in this country. But after that, the whole regulatory apparatus of the federal government, the, the concept changed that the government's got to protect the people. So all kinds of safety and other regulations came in on, on products. Um, you know, baby food, hot dogs, um, uh, cars, uh, everything else, really. And so America took a whole uh, different approach to regulation. The other thing is, that a whole new growth industry was started. I mean, you guys work at Google, right? Most of you, anyway. So there are two great growth industries in America in the late 20th century. One is technology. What was the other one? <laughs> Suing anybody. Lawsuits was the second greatest growth industry of the 20th century. All of product liability law is descended from this car. Uh, basically, the whole idea, the definition of what constituted product liability was greatly expanded uh, for what a defective product in legal terms was greatly expanded because of the Corvair. So really, uh, the Corvair really created, that's why there's so many lawyers today. Adam's two brothers are lawyers, okay? So what can I say? Where did I go wrong? Uh, um, uh, but Corvair collectors today are very passionate people. I mean, they have... Um, Despite the car's flaws and obvious flaws, uh, they, they collect cars, they go to conventions, they have license plates on their cars. Um, one is Ralph Space Who. Uh, the other is F, another one of my favorites is F Space Ralph. My absolute favorite is one word, Nadir, N-A-D-I-R. Um, 
but the the Corvair's the Corvair's uh, impact on American life and thought did not end with product liability law and regulation and all that kind of stuff. The car was killed in 1969, the same year that Ralph Nader made the cover of Time. You see it here, and you see that little Corvair driving off into the sunset. That's the year the Corvair was discontinued. 31 years later, in the year 2000, we had a presidential election in this country. It was George W. Bush, Bush versus Al Gore. Remember the hanging chads in Florida, all that stuff? There was a third party candidate in that election, and that was Ralph Nader, exactly. Bush won, lost the popular vote, as you'll recall, but he won Florida by less than 2,000 votes when the Supreme Court finally decided that issue. Ralph Nader got 95,000 votes in the state of Florida that year. It's obvious intuitively obvious that almost all those votes had Nader not been on the ballot would have gone to Al Gore instead of George W. Bush. So really 31 years after its death the Corvair actually played a defining role in a presidential election because there's no way Ralph Nader would have been on the ballot in Florida. He was a nobody until the Corvair made him famous. So I think it can safely be said at any speed uh, that the, the legacy of the Chevy Corvair helped to make George W. Bush the President of the United States. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, next car in the book is the Mustang, which is really um, sort of the great youth, youth car of the 1960s. I'm going to skip over that quickly uh, because the 60s were a very interesting period. They were sort of like um, two, you know, if you were alive in the 60s, there was the good half and the bad half. The early 60s were all about the Beatles and about civil rights. Um, you know, and they were about the, um, and the, the Ford Mustang sort of captured the youthful exuberance of the, of the 60s, the, the decade when baby boomers came of age. Um, the last half of the 60s was very different. It was basically, this is not Spock, by the way, this is John DeLorean, who invented the other great car of the 60s, if you will, and that's the Pontiac GTO, the first muscle car. And the latter half of the 60s, things took a darker turn in America. I mean, it wasn't civil rights anymore so much. It was urban riots that got the headlines, okay? And the Beatles were replaced by a tougher, harder-edged band in popularity, the Rolling Stones. Uh, and the, the Mustang, the sort of fun and youthful car, was replaced in popularity in a lot of ways, or at least moved to the fore. what moved to the fore was the Pontiac GTO, uh, which was the first muscle car, really. Um, and it... Um, uh, it, it was sort of this, you know, kids were drag racing on streets all the time and all that sort of thing. In fact, in Chicago, uh, the fire department took, took to hosing down some of the streets on Friday and Saturday night so the kids couldn't race on them, actually. It was sort of that pervasive. Um, but it was a, it was a, this is the GTO, which is basically uh, just a big engine in, a, in what was then considered the body of a small car. They were great to drive, by the way. Um, uh, you know, the, the, again, after the 60s was over, America sort of needed to have a little retreat, if you will. The 60s were a very tumultuous period in America. Uh, so along comes the 70s, uh, when things sort of, everybody needed to break a little bit in the practical return to the fore. Uh, the 70s were not a good decade in America. We had Watergate, right? We had defeat in Vietnam. We had inflation, stagflation, we had two oil crises, we had bell-bottom pants, we had Donnie and Marie, I mean all kinds of bad stuff was going on in the 70s, right? Um, so along comes, uh, American cars were terrible, quality was awful back then, I mean they used to, you know, um, uh, fall apart kind of regularly. The sort of the signature car, American car of the decade was the AMC Gremlin. Anybody remember that? I hope not. Okay, some of you do. Yeah, the Gremlin. It was introduced on April Fool's Day, 1970. No kidding. The design was sketched out in the back of a Northwest Airline air sickness bag. Uh, no kidding. But along comes this little Japanese company that was really new in the car business and built this reliable, fuel-efficient car called the Accord. Um, and a decade later, basically, they started building the Accord in America. It was the first foreign car to be built successfully in America at a factory near Columbus, Ohio. And that actually started 
30 years ago this November, the 30th anniversary is coming up. It really changed the whole industrial landscape uh, in, in America. Um, and um, so the Accord really sort of was, again, a retreat from all the wackiness of the 60s and the 70s and sort of a basic common sense, down-to-earth car uh, that got you where you were, uh, where you were going. Um, this is actually one of my favorite cars in the book since it's one of the cars I actually owned, a Chrysler minivan. Uh, we got ours in 1984 when all of our boys were real young, and so we used to take trips to Grandma's house, and this was uh, pretty easy. Uh, the remarkable thing about this car is that the same two guys who developed the Ford Mustang in the 60s developed the minivan. It was Lee Iacocca and Hal Spurlick. So just think about this. In the 60s, the baby boomers were coming of age, just getting their driver's license, right? A big change in their lives at that time, a big transition in their lives. Okay, 20 years later, it's another big transition. They're coming into their 30s, their childbearing years. Um, so, you know, boomers, you know, in the meantime, between the 60s and the 80s, they, you know, they grew up, they went to college, you know, they got haircuts, you know, they got jobs, they got married, and they started families. Not always in that order, but more or less, you know, that's what happened. Um, and along comes this vehicle that basically replaces the station wagon as the basic family transportation. Uh, and it becomes a, a real symbol of a, uh, in, in the 1990s, it became a symbol of the, what was then regarded as the most port, potent force in American politics, that is the soccer mom. Um, so you had this, the New York Times and other papers were sending kids around, to, or reporters around to kids' soccer games to interview mothers about how does it feel to be a political force this year. Uh, one mom told the paper that um, I got to go home and I got to thaw something for dinner. I just don't have time to be a political force today. So uh, it, it played a lot of different ways. Um, the 80s were the period of the yuppies. Uh, the BMW 3 Series was sort of the, the quintessential yuppie car. Uh, ironically, we think of BMWs as really neat cars now, but right at, in, the, in the early, uh, in the uh, late 50s, the company almost collapsed. Um, it was saved by two German half-brothers. Uh, Mercedes-Benz was about to acquire BMW and basically kill the brand. It was saved by two German half-brothers, Herbert and Harold Quant. Uh, Herbert was legally blind, couldn't even drive a car. Uh, Harold's stepfather was one of the more notorious figures in history. His name was Joseph Goebbels. That's really not widely known these days. Um, but anyway, these two brother, half-brothers saved the company, and then basically over the years, BMW just started building better and better cars. And it became the quintessential yuppie car of, of, the, of, the, um, of the 1980s. Um, my favorite bumper, bumper sticker from that era was found on many a BMW. He who dies with the most toys wins. Okay, a little obnoxious, but. Um, Jeep was a, another car in the book. It basically started the whole outdoor recreation thing. Um, you know, at that time, L.L. Bean and other companies were making their products go mainstream, uh, and uh, Patagonia was making all of its coats in bright, vivid pastel colors, et cetera, et cetera. And Jeep did the same thing. They basically took uh, what used to be a work utility vehicle and made it sort of a popular fashion statement, if you will. Um, you know, ironically, uh, you know, Jeep's had nine owners in its corporate lifetime. The last two have been the Germans and the uh, Italians, the same, uh, the same two countries that the Jeep as a wartime vehicle would, uh, helped to defeat in World War II. The Jeep was actually developed to fight the war in 1940. This is actually a fun, this is actually a fun chapter to write. This is the second last car in the book, which is the F-Series pickup truck. And why was it fun? Because it gave me a chance to write about my other passion, besides vehicles, which is country music, okay? Um, I mean, pickup trucks and country music were both marginal sorts of things in American life until the, late, until the 1970s, when they started to go mainstream. Um, and the more pickup trucks sort of went mainstream, the more country music sort of played off that and vice versa. Um, some, of, some of the great country songs are really built around pickup trucks, including one of my all-time favorites you guys have probably heard. It's a Joe Diffie song. Leroy the Redneck Reindeer, anybody know that? No, I guess not, okay. Anyway, Leroy is Rudolph's cousin, and one Christmas Eve, when Rudolph gets sick, Leroy dashes from Nashville to the North Pole in his pickup truck and saves Christmas, basically. 
Um, pickup trucks became very big political symbols in America and still are. So in, in 2010, there was a special election in the state of Massachusetts to fill the seat of the late Ted Kennedy. And the guy who won it in a big upset victory was Scott Brown, a Republican. Unheard of in Massachusetts, right? He won by driving around the state in a, in his, in campaigning in his used pickup truck. That was his symbol. The New York Times wrote about it. Everybody wrote about it. Ten months later, in the midterm congressional elections of 2010, um, there was a candidate for Congress in Tennessee who actually advertised himself as a truck driving, shotgun shooting, Bible reading, crime fighting, family loving country boy. This guy was a Democrat, okay? It shows you how far that went. Uh, he, lost that, he lost his race, by the way, but pickup trucks are still a, um, a big political and cultural symbol in the South and the West. And finally, the last car in the book is the, uh, uh, the Prius, um, which is known uh, as the Pius in some circles after the people who drive it. Um, it was introduced in uh, Japan in 1997, came to the U.S. in the year 2000, the first successful mass market hybrid car. A remarkable engineering feat. I mean, it's as remarkable as the browser. Uh, I mean, it's amazing how they did this. Um, the, uh, uh, the breakthrough year came in, the, in 2003 when the second generation Prius was introduced. It was bigger, roomier, could hold a family, better performing and all that sort of thing. Uh, in the 2003 Oscars, all the movie stars who used to be ferried up to the red carpet right in their big stretch limousines, they were just clamoring over each other to be, you know, photographed arriving in a Prius. And that's what really made the car's popularity take off. Um, and one of my favorite incidents in the book um, occurred in, um, in, um, in March 28, 2007. There's a guy who's arrested on the freeway in the Bay Area for going more than 100 miles an hour in his Prius. And the, this comes to the attention of a guy named Gary Richards. Gary Richards writes the car column called Mr. Roadshow for the San Jose Mercury News in, the, in Silicon Valley, right? He hops on the story because the guy who owned this Prius and was driving it at the time was Steve Wozniak, a name obviously familiar to you. He fires off an email to the Woz and says, hey, is it true you're arrested for going 105 miles an hour in your Prius? The Woz fires back a quick email and says, not true, 104, okay? So the dialogue goes back and forth about what it was like to be in court and all that sort of thing. The judge fined him $700. Um, the, uh, uh, at that point, Mr. Roadshow sends an email that says, well, okay, how did it feel? How did the Prius handle? What was it like going 104 miles an hour in your Prius? And Wozniak sends back an email that says, you know, it was really stable. It felt pretty good. It was actually kind of like my Hummer. <laughs> so here you have a guy who has a Prius and a Hummer, which, I mean, the best analogy I can make for you guys is probably someone who, like, has a Mac and a PC maybe, right? Okay. So he has a foot in both camps. It was a really interesting uh, uh, sort of a cultural exchange there, if you will. Um, anyway, that's basically uh, the, uh, the book. It's sort of a a journey through modern American culture as seen through the lens of automobiles. Uh, you could do the same kind of book, and someone will, about technology, or maybe movies that helped, had a big influence on our culture, um, which certainly a lot of them did. And someone will probably do those books one day, uh, but not me, because I write about cars. Anyway, you've been a great audience. Uh, thanks for having me back at Google. Um, I'll be glad to answer a few questions. Hi, my name is Igor. Um, my question is, how you see the future? What is the next car? You know, that is a great question. So if I'm doing another edition of this book five years from now, right, what would be the car I would include in this book, the most likely car? To be honest with you, I'm not even sure it would be a car. It might even be some sort of a car-type concept, maybe a sort of a blend of car sharing with, you know, social networking or something like that. I mean... Are we going to one day have a company that's called, like, eHarmonyZipCar.com? I mean, who knows, right? Uh, so I think automotive transportation, people want personal transportation. They want to be able to go where they want, when they want. They want 
horizontal freedom, if you will. But a lot of people these days don't want to have a car full time, you know. Some people want to share one, if you will, and this whole social networking thing is, I don't have to tell you guys, it's sort of a big deal. It's the business model is still being worked out, but it could be some sort of a combination of, you know, car club, online dating, social networking, I don't know. Um, it's a very, I can't predict the future, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like that. Thank you. Why didn't you include the station wagon? I thought that was like the quintessential American car. How do we live and think as a people today that is different because of the station wagon? Well, I think the concept of like road trips and like the National Lampoon summer vacation, tying all your luggage to the top of the car and going across, across the country. Yeah, I think um, that's a valid argument. I mean, as I said the, the, in, the, in the afterword of the book, the hardest part was, you know, figuring out which cars to leave out. Uh, a question I often get is, why didn't you include the 57 Chevy, one of the greatest cars of all time? But, you know, I can't really say that we had a definitive change in our lifestyles because of that. Now, station wagons did bring in the family road trip. I really thought that the impact of the minivan, if you're going to choose one family vehicle, the minivan was more revolutionary, I think, um, because not only did it sort of bring family road trips to a new level, but it also ushered in this whole fascination with trucks that Americans have. And the, uh, basically around 1990, Americans were actually buying more trucks, meaning minivans, um, pickup trucks, and Jeeps than they were cars. Now it sort of swung back to automobiles more, but, but trucks are still a very high percentage of what Americans buy for personal transportation. And, and so I really think the mini, minivan over the station wagon really had a more, I mean, I mentioned the station wagon in the book because the minivan supplanted the station wagon for family transportation. But I think the minivan was just um, it, it far more um, uh, influential, not only in culture, but in terms of politics, because the whole soccer mom phenomenon that came up and all that sort of thing. Any more? No one's going to ask you what kind of car I drive? What kind of car do you drive? It's a red one. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much.